everyone. So I think uh, we are an hour behind, so let's just quickly move on. Uh, sorry, let me just quickly start the sessions. Uh, my name is Tom Asen, I'm from uh, IMF, the National Monetary Fund. And I'm actually, the, sorry, it's an honor to chair a session on which is the uh, sovereign data structure from a great point of view. So just before turning to my speakers, uh, given the time constraint, we'd like to just hurry up. I just you know, provide the broad view. In order to, so, so I think the initial intent of the session was to sort of give us thoughts on what academic research has done in terms of solving the instruction. So I was kind of really asked to chair sessions, then my intention was to cover from one perspective from theoretical analysis, which is exactly one, and also uh, Chad is going to kind of provide the insights on it. On the other part is when we try to think about more of empirical slash policy consideration, which is haters and uh, Tiago has kind of agreed to provide us thoughts on it. So let me just just brief sense, which is not familiar with these literatures. Um, I think the first part of the theoretical literature is more focus on sovereign debt destructuring, how the mechanism of debt destructuring. So there's type, two types of debt destructuring taking place in memory. One is going to be the phase bar reductions, where you get the nominal volumes reduced. The other one is actually that the phase bar remains the same, but the maturity has been extended. So there's an impact on debt service. Both of them have an implication in terms of net, you know, sort of a new present. MPB haircut, net present barrier haircut, but I think that one's papers and also Chinese discussion will focus on the latter, which will focus on the maturity extension of the bonds, which is nothing less on the phase bar reduction. Okay. The second part, which is actually the Aiton and Tiago is going to do, is actually more looking at the official financing, what's the term, and what's the sort of a lens of official financing likely to be, and how it's going to affect in the debt sustainability slash the market, the access. To get some sense, uh, when you think of official financing, the IMF, which is sort of responsible, the, official, the fund financing is only last for three years, which is corresponds to the program period. But the work which is ATERS and also for the European Stability Mechanism has done is try to think about you know, what's the opti optimal lens of the optimal financing like it to be. So that's the discussion, and also he has an exercise done with uh, some European country cases like Cyprus, uh, Greece, as well as Portugal, I think I remember correctly. And also, Tiago is actually, is actually from Portugal. He has more insights. He's originally from the Central Bank of Portugal, so he may have insights on it. So, for remark from my end is end, so I will just turn it to my floor for uh, the speakers. Let me just introduce the speakers quickly. Uh, to my left is going to be Juan Sanchez, who is from uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Uh, he has a prominent research background. He has done on the policy issues. And on the next is going to be, as you have seen, Aether Earth uh, from a European Stability Mechanism. And on his uh, which is left, we have uh, Satyaji Chatterjee uh, from the Federal Reserve Bank of the Philadelphia. The last speaker, which we have, the, is going to be Tiago Torres from uh, ITAM, sorry, let uh, me pronounce it, uh, Institute uh, Technolo Technological. Technological uh, Ottoman, sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm not a Spanish speaker, so that's, uh, I think that's it now. But it, uh, the, sorry, Tiago is from uh, Itam, Mexico. Okay, so let's just send it to for to one. Okay, um, thank so, you. Sorry, one, one remark, uh, sorry, we accept the question at the end. So we have a 20 minutes for speakers and 10 minutes for this question. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm learning a lot about this. So uh, what I will present is this paper about uh, sovereign debt restructuring. Um, and these are my views and not the views of the Federal Reserve, of course. Uh, OK, so the, the, the motivation is something uh, that we, we document, but I think uh, people studying uh, sovereign debt restructuring already know is that the fact that they usually involve uh, maturity extensions. Okay, and, and, how, and although these uh, maturity extensions are very common, uh, it's, it's not easy or we, there is no theory yet to that help us think about why these maturity extensions are, are, are useful. Uh, so what we are going to do in the paper is precisely try to build a, a model of several and restructurings that help us understand the reason for uh, maturity extensions. 
Okay? Um, so that, 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 that's the goal of the paper. So what I'm going to do is show you some evidence on maturity extensions in distress dis restructurings. Uh, and that's kind of the fact that this distress restructuring is like one difference between uh, some of the restructuring that you discussed before and, and the restructures I'm looking at uh, here. Um, I will show you briefly what the model is about and, sh and um, show you the statistics that the model can reproduce. And then I will emphasize these four features that are important for maturity extension. One is the fact that the income recover between the time of uh, default and the time of restructuring. And the second is, what we were uh, discussing in the previous paper, is the exclusion um, that country have even after restructuring. It was mentioned 5.8 years in the previous presentation. I would have something similar, show you a figure. And then, other thing that was mentioned that I was always happy that these things were uh, mentioned because these are things that we uh, incorporate is a regulatory cost of, of book value uh, haircuts. Um, so this is the cost that the, the banks uh, face at the time of restructuring. So, uh, so how that affect restructuring. And the last factor that is, is present in, in, in these models of, um, of maturity is, is the dilution. The fact that, that you know, when, uh, for long term debt, uh, issuance, or new issuance of, 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 of debt, uh, decrease the value of um, of previous debt, and so that's usually uh, an, an issue that is incorporated in this model. And this is going to play an important role for moving uh, maturity extensions in the other direction for reducing maturity extensions. Okay, so let me show you briefly some empirical evidence that we constructed uh, using the data in Cruces and Trebes and some some formulas to be able to back up uh, maturity. Uh, so if we look at, at this episode, 162 episodes, uh, the, the, the haircut, uh, depending on the, the way you measure, but um, they're around 40%. But the face value haircut, the reduction in the, in, the, in the payments, if we do not discount the payments, is around 20%. So it means that part of the, of the, uh, of the haircut come from extending the maturity of the payment. So, uh, using some formula that we have in the paper, we recover a number for the maturity extension that on average is 3.4 uh, years, okay? Although there is like a large, dis large dispersion in, in, maturity, you know, in maturity extensions. So if the first issue that I mentioned was that income recovers between the time of uh, default and the time of restructuring. So this table is, is showing uh, for uh, the cases for which we found data with 149 cases. Uh, how much uh, the, the GDP cycle and the GDP per capita recover uh, between the time of default and the time of restructuring. So you can see that as some of these episodes, the restructuring is relatively close to the time of default, so this, there was no time for re to recover. So in those, those cases, you just a very small recovery, but as you condition on, on the ones that took longer until restructuring, you can see that the recovery start getting larger and you see recoveries, depending if you look at the mean or the median, of the order between 4 and 6%, okay? So the income does, does recover uh, during this time. The second thing is going back to the issue of, of exclusion. This is uh, from a paper of Cruces and Treves in the AEG in 2013. So what we did, we, you just, we, they just estimate estimate the probability of remaining excluded of credit market, and I think the issue that has been raised before are, are important is that, I mean, one criticism on this estimation is do they really, do the countries want, want to issue debt or are they just, so what we observe is they issue debt or not. Uh, so, uh, but what I want to show you here is that it's, it's very high the probability that they remain excluded one year after two years. So if you just want to give one probability, uh, so we do this in the, in the red line. So you put a 75 probability that you are excluded next year, and then from the other year to the other year, again 75%, and then 75%, that's the red line. And you see that that matches like pretty close, pretty, pretty closely, and it's even conservative later, like after five years. And this has to do with these countries that never came back. So, so we're not that concerned about uh, that long, long run. So what we're going to do in the model, we're going to introduce this red line that, that, that we have here in this figure. Uh, the, the last point, I think, um, maybe in this audience, uh, I have to dis discuss it even less, but 
it's clear that uh, the regulatory, uh, there are regulatory costs for, for banks of, of face value haircuts. Uh, this played a very important role, for instance, in the Latin American crisis of the 80s, where the, uh, the, the, the debt were loans to banks directly, and this is very well documented. But as we discussed uh, today, this also played a role in the, in the recent European crisis. Um, and, and so that, that's, that's the third thing that we want to incorporate into, into this. The model, I'm going to show you uh, the model with, uh, with, with, a, with a few plots to see how, how, how the model looks like. So in the model, you, you have the, follow, the following options. So we're modeling a country and we're modeling lenders. So I'm going to show you uh, the lenders are going to price the debt in, in this model. Uh, and these are the, 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 the things that may happen to a country. So a country maybe, if you want to call it in normal times, okay? So we, we start with that box with the country in normal times. And then the country have, has a choice of defaulting a given period or paying the debt. If the country defaults in the next period, it's gonna, it's gonna be in what we call uh, restructuring. And I'll, I'll show you later what that is. And if the country pays in the next period, it's gonna be again in normal times, with probably the 88%, and it's gonna go to a sudden stop, a period in which is, is excluded from market, it's not a receipt, uh, with 12%. So this is, um, uh, this is to incorporate something that, uh, that doesn't have to do directly with the uh, characteristic of the countries, have more to do with the lenders directly, that for something that happened in international credit market, the country cannot access international market. This number here comes from an estimate, uh, estimation that we, have, uh, that we have in the paper. So now what, what, what happened when a country is in, uh, is, is in this state of exclusion, what we call uh, uh, in a sudden stop. Well, the country still have the option of making the payment. The difference with the previous case is, and in this case, it cannot borrow, okay? So if they can make the payments and continue, and in the, uh, but the probability is now continuing in this state of exclusion are a bit higher, are 42%, because these states are persistent. So when you enter this state, uh, you're gonna be there for, for maybe one, two, uh, three years. So. Uh, that's where the 42 probability come from. In, in this case, the country can default and it's also going to go uh, to restructuring. So what is uh, newer in this model is the, the, the restructuring phase. Um, so in the restructuring phase, what we're gonna have is that a, a, a bargaining protocol in which the lenders of all, all the country can make the offers, and when they make the offers, they are going to uh, consider what, what kind of offer the other party will accept, and they will decide if they want to make the offer or, or, or not. Just pass on the opportunity and wait until the next period. Okay, the offer can be accepted or rejected, and if the offer is, 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 is rejected, the country continue restructuring one more period. So in this model, um, the, the, the time of restructuring is gonna be endogenous. It's gonna depend on when the offer is accepted. And um, when the offer is accepted, we're gonna have, what I showed you before in the, in the figure is that with 75% probability in the next period after the restructuring, the country is gonna be excluded, and if not, it's, gonna, it's going to go with 25% probability, probability, it's going to go back to, uh, to normal times, okay? So that, 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 that's, that's the model that, uh, that we have, and this, this will play over and over uh, uh, forever in the model, okay? Uh, just to say that the, the, the way we, we introduce a regulatory cost is it, is it as an additional cost, additional cost to the market losses of uh, face value losses, which we're going to uh, calibrate at, uh, at, at 3%. Uh, 3%. This, has to, this number uses different uh, statistics to write to the number, and it's, we're not that clear about which number we should use, but the, this number has to do with the cost of raising equity that the, uh, that the bank would face if they have to recognize, acknowledge uh, this, um, this face value or book value uh, haircuts. Okay, so th th this table is just to show you a lot of statistics that you can generate with the, with the model. And we think of the model as a, a laboratory to be able to do different exercises to understand what is, what is happening. Um, so the, the, in the model, all these things, uh, are determined uh, endogenous as a part of the model, and what we what we want to show is in this in this big table in only one slide. So you can you can look at the statistics that you want. Is that the um, the model does generate many of the features that uh, that we observe in the data? Uh, longer spread being higher than shorter spread. The spread being higher 
in, uh, in bad times than in good times, also procedural duration and maturity, also a uh, large variation of, of consumption in this developing economy relative uh, to income and, and, and different, uh, different facts like that. So now, now what we want to do, so the, the, this step here is a step in which we are, uh, if you want, evaluating the model to say, okay, is, is the model a good uh, laboratory to uh, proceed and do some experiments? So uh, by looking at, uh, at this table, we're going to say, well, the model look, seems to capture uh, some important feature, so we are going to uh, proceed and, and use it to, to, to understand more things. Uh, more things about the model, the model document can get them the, the haircut that I showed you in the data, also the dispersion of haircuts. And what we are more important, the model can also get the mean maturity extension and also the, the distribution of extension. So I think this, this graph is, is very clear to show you what, what happened in the data and in the model. So you have in the x-axis are the years of extension, and in the other case, in the, in the y-axis, you have the percent of cases that are, are in there. And you can see that the both in the model in the data, there is like a rich dispersion in terms of maturity extension, but it, it, like the, uh, both uh, maturity extension are mostly, uh, mostly, mostly positive and around, around three or, or, or four years, okay? Uh, so now, uh, let, me, let me go directly to, to what we are trying to use the model for, so to try to understand restructuring. Uh, as I mentioned, these are the, the four sources that I consider, so I will I go and, and, and get a bit into each of them. So what, what we do here is like when we solve the model, and think that we have the model and we're gonna solve, uh, run it for uh, a million years or, or, or many times for, for 100 years to think of this as different countries, and these countries are going to default and, and we are going to uh, be able to analyze different uh, restructuring episodes. And in this restructuring, what we do in this table, we split the, the, the restructuring episode depending if there was recovering income and not recovering income, okay? And the other column called all, it has all the restructuring. So you can see there that the haircut that the model gives us is around, uh, again, 30 or 40%, and, and, uh, and the extensions are, are also uh, higher than, uh, than, than three years. The duration of default is the time between the default and, and the restructuring. What is more important for the point that the, the recovery in income help with the maturity extension is to notice the difference uh, between these, these, these two numbers here. The, 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 the restructuring that, that have income uh, recovery, recovery have like longer maturity extension. So if, if you want to take a number from here, again, we were thinking about maturity extension of about 3.5%. What we see here is by this dispersion in income, you can get up to around one year of difference just coming from how much uh, income is recovered. And, uh, and we do other exercises to try to argue that this, this is uh, an important channel uh, in the model. And we also document this, this, this for the data. So in the data, we also look at the maturity extensions in the case when there was more recovery, it was also, also larger. Uh, so the, the, the second point, and and um, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, going, I'm going quickly because I know everybody wanna go for lunch. Uh, so the, 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 second, the second fact is that, uh, is, is the fact about exclusion, okay? Uh, so what exclusion does, imagine you are, you are in a country and if you know that you are not going to be able to issue debt again for a, for a number of period, what, we want to, what you want to do is to issue long-term debt, okay? Such that the, the, the yearly payment that you have to do to make in the, in the next years are relatively low. So what, what you see here, we, we calibrated this, this exclusion at 75% as the data that I show and it was shown before uh, uh, suggests. But then I calibrate, I, I really, we show you what happened in the model if we just change this probability. Again, what we are trying to learn is okay, what would change if that probability changes to see how important it is. And we're gonna, we're gonna change it we're gonna lower up to 12%. Remember that 12% is the probability of exclusion uh, in normal times, okay? So what we are saying there is like, okay, what would happen with the maturity extension if the time of restructuring would look like just like normal times in terms of the probability of extension? And so you can see there that the maturity extension almost disappeared. The maturity extension are slightly, uh, slightly higher than, than, than zero. So this, this definitely play an important role maybe something like three years uh, in, 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 in 
increasing the, the, the maturity extension. Okay? So I told you about the recovery in income, and I, I just told you about the exclusion. So let me go to the, the last issue. Uh, the, the third force. The third force that we talk is this extra cost of, of book value uh, losses. And what we, I, I told you we calibrated at 3%, and here I'm gonna show you what happened if this value is zero. So in that case, the maturity extension is like one year shorter, 2.4 uh, years. Uh, but you can, you can imagine this number to be as high as 5%, and in some episodes, you know, we are, we are trying to um, calibrate the model to, to see how well it, 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 it can do in terms of matching this, this average of all these 160 episodes. For sure, there are, there are episodes in which you, can, you, you may want to think of this kappa being higher even than 5%. The Latin American debt crisis, I think, is, is, um, uh, is one of, of the episodes. And what you see is that when this increases, maturity extensions increase, so it can go almost up to, uh, up to 4%. Just moving this this this, part, this 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 percent from three percent to 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 five percent, um, and the last uh, force that I want to discuss is this this dilution. So um, dilution it, it has been discussed a lot in these uh, theoretical models of sovereign default, and uh, it, it basically uh, I think everybody is, is uh, knows what the, the dilution does, but the fact that has on, on, on restructuring is, is very specific. So the idea is that um, when the country, um, so imagine a country that comes to a period with debt of uh, 10 years of maturity and is thinking about uh, issue, I, issuing new debt. Um, so and imagine just, just for simplicity that this country have uh, no incentive to issue uh, long-term long -term debt. There is no risk of default, no risk of sudden stop, there is no things. So what is this country going to do? Is this country going to change the maturity from 10 years to one year? Well, so the, the, the answer is, is no. The country is not going to do that because by doing that, what is it going to do? It's going to increase the value of the debt that has already issued, okay? And with this, it's going to make richer investors, but the country uh, um, doesn't care about the investor. So the country is going, probably going to maturity nine in the next year in that scenario. Now imagine the same country, but that has just defaulted and is restructuring and it's going to issue new debt to give, uh, to, uh, to give back to, uh, to the investor. Well, this country doesn't have this problem. The old debt uh, is, is, is gone. I mean, it's gonna be what the new country is issued. So this country, in this example, is gonna issue debt exactly of maturity one. So in this case, uh, in this extreme case that I'm, I'm describing, the, 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 the shortening of maturity would be equal to eight years, okay? So in, in our model, when we take all the other three forces that we discussed, well, you can see that the model indeed gives negative maturity extension. So, um, so just, just, just to, uh, to summarize, what we, what we do in, the, in these papers is um, document mat the maturity extension, uh, are, 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 we see them very often in, in restructuring, is develop this model, and show that these three forces uh, really push for maturity extension for be longer. The recovery in income, uh, the exclusion after restructuring, and the regulatory cost of uh, book value uh, haircut. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks for Shimon for asking me to, uh, you know, basically discuss this paper, and it's kind of a 
pretty informative uh, conference so far. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, what uh, Juan just presented. And uh, so I want to emphasize what he said at the very end, which is that, you know, in these, when we, when we, the models that we have, that we, that we use to think about sovereign borrowing, sovereign default, restructuring, etc., cetera, um, actually has a kind of a big puzzle in terms of maturity, choice, okay? And uh, this is not just a puzzle in terms of restructuring, and it is actually severe, but it is also a puzzle in like normal times as well, um, a little bit. Um, so as he pointed out, you know, restructuring typically involves replacing defaulted debt with uh, new debt that is of significantly longer maturity. We saw examples of that today, you know, there were lots of data presented that pretty much confirms that. Okay, and the goal of this paper is to see if this fact can be explained in one of these quantitative sovereign debt models. For ease of exposition, I'm going to just call it QSD because it rolls up easily. From so this is a QSD model of the type that uh, one just talked about and Tamona has worked on, etc. cetera. Um, so at an intuitive level, you know, when we're thinking about what is it that lenders and what is it creditors would, or, or borrowers would want, we might think that the sovereign would be better off with longer maturity debt because it reduces the uh, debt service. And creditors, on the other hand, because they're always worried about default and stuff, they would probably prefer short-term debt. But it turns out the logic of these models, actually everybody prefers short-term debt. And the reason for that is very simple. The person, uh, the, the sovereign that is being modeled in these, in these models is a discretionary policy maker. So if you have long-term debt and you arrive into the period with long-term debt and you decide to issue more debt, you're inevitably imposing a capital loss on existing creditors because they hold your debt and the debt is becoming less valuable. But of course, the sovereign has no interest in taking that into account, and as a result, would issue debt, in a sense, kind of in an excessive way. And of course, creditors understand that, and as a result, the debt, if it's long-term, becomes expensive from the get-go, okay? And of course, now, in return, the sovereign understands this, and therefore would like to issue debt that is very short-term, because that reduces the costs of borrowing. So what you get is a model where both creditors and debtors would want short-term debt. You know, but that's not what we see in the data. Governments issue long-term debt, and in the restructuring, as uh, he pointed out, as one pointed out, there is no more existing debt is all gone, so you're kind of starting afresh, and then the logic of uh, dilution basically points you towards debt that is very short-term, and you don't see that. You see the opposite. You see the restructuring inevitably generally leads to an extension of maturity. So it's kind of a big puzzle in the context of these models, okay? That's basically, so it's an interesting thing. And so what, uh, how can this puzzle be resolved? I think this was to the credit of the authors, you know, they, uh, they thought about things that would really matter. And, uh, and it turns out that it does matter, okay? Which often happens in these models is that you can write something down and put it into a model, but it turns out to make very little difference. Um, but it turns out in this case, the three things that they focused on actually did make a difference. The first one is very nice, because it comes out of the model in a very natural way, which is the cyclical dynamics of it. So maturity is shortened before default, for the same reason that we have the dilution, the creditors get worried, and it becomes very expensive to borrow long term. So there's a, con uh, there's a shortening of maturities right before default. This is a well-known uh, fact that has actually been explained in the context of these models, and, and Vaughn's model also explains it. And then after that, you know, if you, if you have a, you know, if, then as you know, the country recovers and the fears of default go away, then the natural tendency in these models would be for maturity to, to spread out. And, there has to be a reason for it. You have to, uh, I said that in the, in the first slide, that you know, everyone wants short maturity debt, so how can you even explain long maturity debt? The way you explain it in the context of this model, perhaps I should have said that, is that you, you introduce a feature that makes short term debt extremely dangerous. And the feature is the sudden stops that uh, Guan talked about. So if you have a lot of short term debt, and you're rolling it over every period, like 20%, 30% of your GDP, 
and all of a sudden you have a buyer strike and there's no one willing to lend to you, then you have to roll over that debt, which is a huge, you take a big hit on your consumption. So that makes short-term debt very, very dangerous in that way. And to avoid that danger, countries issue long-term debt. Okay, so that's the way we understand the costs and benefits of short-term versus long-term debt. So in this kind of a setup, once you have gone into default and you, your, your, your uh, income is recovery, then of course you're going to get to your sweet spot in terms of maturity and that automatically gives you maturity extension. So this is kind of a nice automatic feature of these models, which is uh, kind of a good thing because you're not, you don't really have to do anything, you get that in a sense for free. Okay? And then there's this fear of rollover shocks. So your income is very low when you're, you know, you know is below trend, and so this danger of a short term uh, of a rolling over is, is particularly high. And that's another reason why you want to issue longer term maturity debt right in the middle of a restructure. Right? So that's a second way in which uh, this, this, this maturities get extended. The reason why maturities get extended because income is temporarily below trend and uh, rollover shock is going to be particularly debilitating in those circumstances. And the final thing that uh, he pointed out was this lender reversion to unpaid principal. You know, bankers don't like to take book value losses, which was, as he pointed out, one of the biggest problems in the 1980, you know, the Latin American debt crisis. It's probably the main reason why the crisis took so long to get resolved. And it was finally resolved a lot of bailouts. Um, but uh, so that is a very sensible thing. We don't, as economists, we don't fully understand why this is the case. Why do, you know, there are good regulatory reasons maybe, but then you have to ask why the regulation set up that way. But uh, it is a fact, and the model just takes it as given, that, uh, you know, lenders simply do not like to have, to have a reduction in the principal uh, payment. Rather, they would get the same present value uh, without getting a loss on the book value, rather have the loan being paid off over a longer period of time. And so these are the three things they put into the model, and all of them turn out to be important, which is kind of a good thing, you know, because oftentimes, you know, we put in things that turn out to be not so important, but uh, so it turned out that they had good intuition on all these different things. So it's a very well-executed paper, I like it a lot. Um, uh, uh, there is also one thing he didn't really talk about from a point of view of solving these models, you know, which, uh, you know, these models are getting more and more complicated because the computers are getting better and better and software is getting better and better. So we are capable, we are, our capacity to solve models of this type is getting better. Uh, but still it's very challenging and uh, anyone has kind of borrowed stuff from a different part of economics literature uh, that to make the makes the solution of these models uh, possible, you know, and he, his model is pretty complicated in, in terms of the, all the things that he's put into it. Um, but it is a little bit uh, uh, kind of, uh, it's out there in terms of <laughs> what it is doing. Basically, uh, there are lots of shocks in this model, okay, and uh, typically we don't like to put in that much shocks into these models because, you know, the shocks are basically unexplained stuff. But there's a lot of that in this model, but that's the way the model is essentially solved. And, uh, uh, you know, this is like a, a new way of solving very complicated models. I've personally used it myself in some of my research, so I, uh, you know, I think they're kind of interesting. But uh, it remains to be seen if the profession at large, namely our colleagues, are going to basically put up with it, but we'll see. Um, so it's, it's actually kind of an innovative paper in that dimension as well. Um, okay, so, all right, so I'm going to, I'm not going to really say too much about the restructuring part of things because it's already been said, a fair amount has been said about it. What I'm going to talk more about is just maturity, the, the, how do we, how do these models actually think about, uh, about maturity, how, what are the, maybe is there something missing in our uh, theories about maturity choice, which may also be relevant, as relevant in normal times, and may even also be relevant to restructuring. So these comments are mostly comments about maturity choice, okay? 
Now, what we see in the data is that we often see countries issuing debt at fairly rapid succession out of different maturities. Okay. So, if you have a theory that connects the fundamentals of the model to maturity choice, you would then have to explain how is it that a country that just issued three-year bonds a month ago now wants to issue ten-year bonds or vice versa, because three and ten, these are pretty big difference numbers, okay? And uh, so that's kind of a little bit of a challenge, you know, because our models would generally say there's something about a three-year bond or a, a 12-year bond or a 15-year bond that's like the right number. And unless something drastically changes between one in a month period, you know, I'm going to get a very different answer in the model in terms of what is the optimum, optimum maturity uh, to, to use. You know? So if you start thinking like that, then maybe you have to start thinking about what it is that maybe it's not on the borrower's side that we have to think hard about to explain these rapid, this kind of changes in the amount, the maturity of debt being issued. Perhaps it is the lenders who are calling the shots. You know, they, they one time the, the underwriter tells you, tells the sovereign that, you know, there is a lot of demand for 10-year bonds because there are some pension funds who are looking for long-term investment. So I can get you a good price if you show 10-year bond. So you say, fine, I'll do that. At other times, they say, you know, there's a whole bunch of other countries that are issuing three-year bonds, and if you issue a three-year bond, then I can securitize this whole thing and give it to a private investor, and so then you're going to get a pretty good price. So depending upon what lenders want, and lenders don't want the same thing every day, you know, there might be, uh, you know, that these maturities move around just because lenders want different things at different points in time. Now, there is a way in which they could potentially take that into account because I mentioned these shocks that they have in the model, but the shocks are all on the borrower's side in the model. And uh, it's, you know, if they think about it a little bit, maybe the shocks can be moved over to the lender side and it might uh, generate a, a different model, you know, and they might make some sense out of that as well. And maybe leverage the shocks in a way that could be novel, I think. Um, and then this is my last slide, really. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing I want to say about, cashman, about maturity choice is that if you think about the United States, for instance, you know, the choices of maturity is, not, is basically made by the Treasury. And what is the Treasury up to? Their problem is they have a variable cash flow. There's stuff coming into their accounts. There's stuff flowing out of their accounts. There are big gaps in this. You know, all the tax revenues come in April. <laughs> Expenditure is being made throughout the year. So they have a cash management problem. <coughs> and they're basically issuing debt to smooth out these inflows and outflows of funds into the treasury account. And, uh, and what do they do? And they're very, they're very attuned to what the market can absorb. So they, you know, they choose maturities, they choose issuances to make sure they don't create a big, uh, you know, they don't they minimize the impact on interest rates, basically. That's kind of what they're trying to do. Um, in contracts, you know, when you think about these sorts of cash management issues, they're simply not part of these models. The models are very focused on the borrowing side, on the sovereign, and, and uh, on, on the levels of debt the sovereign wants to issue, but they're not so focused about this, you know, this almost like this cash management sorts of issues, okay? So, but my sense is that I think if you're trying to really get a good grip on maturity uh, choice by the sovereigns, including the U.S., you know, I think you really have to kind of think about this cash management problem carefully and, and exactly how, how these countries, are, the treasury departments of the various countries are trying to solve the cash management problem. So, uh, in summary, I think, you know, this is a very nice paper, really. It's quite innovative in, in many dimensions. I mean, we didn't go through all the details of the paper, but there are a lot, there are at least several other really innovative parts to this paper. So I think it's a very nice paper. Uh, it will be well published for sure. Um, um, and I think, you know, they are focusing on, like most of the QSD literature on the borrowing side to explain maturity choice. Uh, but I, I think that's a fine place to start, but hopefully we will not stop there. I would like, uh, you know, the authors to think more about what's going on in the lending side. And a more detailed modeling of lender behavior, basically the demand side and the market mechanics as to how these 
sovereign debt markets, you know, how debt is placed in these markets, the underwriters, the whole apparatus of, of getting debt from the sovereign out of the marketplace. The whole apparatus need to be examined carefully, I think, especially if you're trying to understand the shortage costs. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Cambridge University, Timothy Wick, who's with Deloitte. And I forgot to add a disclaimer because this, these are our views and they have little or nothing to do with the use of the ESM. learning as possible uh, from the different policy actions that we're taking as, uh, in an attempt to resolve the, the debt crisis in Europe. Right? And uh, so and one observation from where, from where we move is the fact that at the, at, the beginning of, uh, at the beginning of the resolution of the crisis through the issuance of bailouts, the bailouts provided to the European countries, either by the Euro area official lenders or by the IMF, they were designed along the lines of the International Monetary Fund. Right? So the, the lending conditions of these official loans were identical, either if the loans were coming, or basically identical, if the loans were coming from the Euro area or they were coming from Washington. Right? What happened is that as the crisis deepened and was not being resolved, uh, the Euro area authorities, they, they, they moved away and they, they modified the way in which they were providing support for, for, for the aging sovereigns. And the main, the main differences uh, were on the one hand, the, the support moved beyond the traditional balance of payment support by the IMF. Best example of this is the Spanish program, which was focused only on uh, bank, uh, bank crisis resolution. And then the, the other two, two aspects that are very important, and uh, which we are basing, basing our analysis, the fact that the, ES, the European lenders, they were willing to, to provide much larger loans in size and that in addition they were, uh, they were willing to provide uh, much longer maturities for the repayment and they decided to charge uh, spreads over, over the cost of funding for the official lenders significantly lower than the IMF. And this is something that um, I mean, we, we, we sort of like to call when we are thinking about this approach to crisis resolution, the uh, re repayment, uh, re repayment flow management approach. Uh, the idea that uh, that you move, uh, you, you pay in time with the, with the maturity on the, of the loans in order to provide a policy space. And the idea of all this uh, line of research is to understand what this new policy space delivers, if it delivers anything at all. I just like a few, a few graphs that exemplify what I, what I mean. So these two, they are shown for Ireland and for Portugal, the composition of the debt creditors. And what one can see is as the, as the crisis hit, uh, there was an increase in the amount of debt that was coming from official creditors, especially from the European Stability Mechanism or the European Financial Stability Fund, which are the, the, the blue lines, the, the, the blue areas there. Um, this table sort of summarizes with numbers the story that I just said uh, regarding the evolution of the condition of the official loans. So what this table is providing is in the columns, is, uh, these are uh, time spots at which uh, we, we report the different uh, conditions of the loans, the maturities and the interest rates for either the European lenders, the ESF and ESM, or the IMF. And uh, Ireland exemplifies very well what happened. If you see the first call, the first program, that, uh, the first two official loans that were provided to Ireland, uh, they had, to, either by the IMF or the European lenders, they had the same activity, around seven years. And the, the interest rate to be paid, if anything was even higher from from the Euro area official loans than from the IMF. But then in June 2011, then again in, in 
and I think it was November, November 2013, there were modifications to these loans as the situation was uh, going out of control. And this, this is sort of represented on, that on, on, on the table. If you look at the fourth column and you compare the conditions of the, I of the IMF and the, uh, the Euro area loans for Ireland, you can already see the difference there. Right? So the maturity of the European loan became 22 years uh, as opposed to the still seven years of the, of the IMF loan. And the interest rate chart uh, moved from being like uh, basically 100, 150 basis points higher to at that time being almost 100 basis points cheaper. Right. And there is a similar story for Portugal and the official laws for Portugal. And this translated into this, this presents the, the redemption profile of the official debt. Right? And basically uh, following this, uh, these modifications to the loan, so basically the strategy that was being followed in Europe was uh, while originally like all these official loans in red, they were to be repaid at the same time as the IMF loan, so this was generating a a repayment cliff, a pretty serious repayment cliff. The strategy in Europe was to sort of let's, let's move this thing forward so that we generate a smoother repayment profile and see what happens. So, okay, so this is the observation. This is the big experiment that the Euro area authorities decided to do in order to try to, in, in order to, try to, to, solve, the, to solve the problems there. And uh, what we have done is, uh, is try to, try to Try to take this experiment and use it to think, to think about like, I mean, what, what this has given us, what, what it should have given us, I mean, what could be the potential effects. And already one goes and in, just looks at the existing theory about official lending, uh, catalytic effects, uh, debt crisis, uh, sovereign risk. Uh, one knows that official lending is doing two things. So on the one hand, it's affecting the, the incentive of governments to issue, to default, and it's doing that the same way that uh, tax revenues, growth, or inflation can do. And on the other hand, it's also affecting investors' incentive, whether investors are going to be willing to lower the debt or are going to be ready to just like get the gas and, and move on to invest in another country, is potentially affected by, by, by the actions of the official sector. Right? Uh, so what we have tried to what we are trying to do on this uh, on this research agenda. Is, is try to understand how these two sets of incentives uh, have played out. Uh, we, we, we want to understand whether uh, uh, there is a trade-off, so a positive effect on the government means a negative effect on the investors. Uh, we, we would like to understand the extent to which uh, playing with the conditions of the official loans uh, has uh, any implications for the willingness of the government to, defer, to default or repay or whether it has any incentives for investors to roll over in situations in which they would have fleed otherwise. That's what the literature calls catalysis. And then, of course, uh, this, uh, we, we think that uh, trying to answer these questions is, is, is extremely important because it has very significant policy implications, right? So with the arrival of the Euro area crisis, the way that fiscal lending proceeds, including by the IMF, has changed massively. So the IMF, for instance, they have to pay to they have to modify this exceptional access policy to introduce a systemic exception that would allow to lend to countries like Greece, despite Greece was not sustainable, but because it could have systemic effects, then the, the policy was modified so that the IMF was has effectively lent it to uncertain solvency, something that it shouldn't do according to the Articles of Agreement and risk management techniques and fund. I mean, of course, this, this change in approach then. Uh, it has potential implications for how the authorities want to manage these spillovers, how they want to manage contagion. The contagion will potentially have important implications for monetary policy, despite this is something that if we are, I'm not going to be talking about, we are not looking at. Jan Carlo is, but we are not. And it, has, uh, it may have important implications for the way that the authorities evaluate their sustainability and for the frameworks that are in place to evaluate their sustainability. Right? So well, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna do the rest of my time is present very very briefly the the outcome of the theoretical mechanisms that we obtained from a, from a, from a model of reform with official lenders that we have built. Um, then I will provide a bit of empirical evidence using the data set that we have put together about whether there is any kind of catalytic effect or what, what, what is the effect of, of these official loans and the terms they have on, on the conditions at which the market success. And if I have time, I will, I will bring back some, some of the potential price implications of the results we find. Right, so the model. The model um, is a quantitative uh, model 
of the of, uh, sorry in default that follows uh, uh, Coresa Kigo, in which uh, we, we have a government that is setting taxes, is borrowing on a certain basis from investors and can choose a repeal whether he wants to repay or he wants to default. And if he defaults, suffers an output loss. In the, the, the model is um, it's an interesting model that uh, contains two types of risks for the, for, the, for the authorities. On the one hand, there is a rollover risk. So there might be a, a market closure and then like a rolling over the debt uh, becomes impossible. This provides the governments with an incentive to reduce the level of debt. But the model also has output risk. And when the government is facing this output risk, then the incentive the government has is to run up the debt and smooth consumption. Right? So what we do with this model is augment it and we include two types of official lenders. One that is lending using short maturities, we like to call it the IMF. The other one is offering uh, longer maturity loans. That's the one that we like to call uh, the European official lenders. Um, we don't add any seniority of these official loans. We don't add any moral hazard features in the model clear what's inside and what not. Right, and um, once uh, Timothy managed, managed to, to solve the, the, the model in the computer, so that's what uh, all, all the things that were going on, uh, the, the, main, the main findings for, from, from the analysis is that um, in the economy with artificial lenders, there is a, 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 a volume of debt above, uh, and if the country is above that level and suffers a loss of market access, it's going to default, okay? So that threshold for, uh, for uh, the debt stock in which a country defaults during a liquidity crisis increases in the presence of official lenders. And it increases more the, the more accommodative, that is, the longer are the maturities that the official lenders can have. Right? So this should be good news. It's telling us that theoretically the official lenders are shielding the countries from. Uh, from they are shielding the countries from default in more occasions during the liquidity crisis. But there is, like always, that you have an interest in an economic problem, there is a trade, right? And these, these families of models, they, they, they do not only give us a debt threshold above which the country defaults during the liquidity crisis, they also deliver a debt threshold above which the country will default during fundamental crisis. And it turns out that in our model, having official lenders that provide these accommodative terms is reducing the debt stock uh, above which the country is to default under a fundamental crisis. So therefore, uh, while on the one hand the official lenders uh, improve their resilience against liquidity crisis, they are also making sovereigns more default prone when they are faced with fundamental crisis. Right? And we, in, in, in the paper, what we do is like we, we use all the data we have to calibrate the model to Portugal, we run a different set of counter factors uh, regarding the, the amount of uh, official loans received by the ESM or received by the, by the IMF. And what we saw is that uh, depending on the conditions so, and the volumes of official lending uh, for Portugal, anything between 80 and, and 180 percent of GDP uh, could be sustainable. Right? And we also, through, through all these counter factors, what we are able to observe is that as regards the, this this uh, debt threshold for illiquidity is the maturities, is the maturities that the, the ingredient of, the, of this official debt, or the, the specific term for the official debt, that seems to have a stronger effect on the sustainable thresholds. Right. So, with these theoretical observations, uh, then we, 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 we try to go and use the data to back up something. So, we, we, we have not done yet the effort of trying to understand what happens with. Uh, with the default thresholds and, uh, against fundamental shocks, also because it's a question that we are not very sure of how we can tackle. But what we can do is, is try to understand what is the effect of official loans in the, in the possibility of losing market access by understanding what is the effect of official loans and their terms on the conditions and the, at which the, the, the countries access, access uh, sovereign bond markets. And uh, to do this, we take advantage of the fact, this was uh, Tor explaining that at, at the beginning this morning, there were a couple of occasions in which the Euro area authorities, they decided to modify the terms of the loans. This happened in June 2011, and again in 2013. Right? The, um, and then what we do is we, we, we take these uh, policy actions as, as, as experiments. Right? And then like, uh, 
you just see the way which the solid bond markets uh, behave around this, this different, this different um, policy axis. The first thing that I'm going to show is, uh, is some very, very uh, straightforward to understand and let's say simple uh, case studies, which I'm going to be plotting the yield curves for Ireland and Portugal around uh, some of these announcements. I'm also going to be showing some data about the behavior of bid and ask spreads uh, around the same contract modifications. Okay? So, way to read the left and the right. Uh, chart is the same. The blue line that we call pre-announcement, that's the yield curve. This is the three-year, the five-year, and the ten-year maturity. So that's the yield curve on the week before the announcement. Okay? You see this is a heavy inverted curve with a short part of the curve of about 15%. This is a default, right? Uh, the greenish line in between, that is the same yield curve one month after the announcement. And the yellow curve is the same, the, the yellow line is the same curve three months after the announcement. Uh, these bars that we are plotting here, they present on the, on the right hand side axis the amount of change on the spread since the week before the announcement of this uh, seven year maturity extension. And uh, the drop, as you can, as you can see, is, is very significant, it's dramatic. We are talking. We are talking over 4% uh, drop in the, short, uh, in the short interest rate. And one thing that we believe is interesting, and I'm going to come back to this afterwards, is that this effect is not, uh, is not homogeneous across maturities. The effect is much stronger on the 3 and on the 5, which are precisely the period in which the, 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 the repayment of the official loans was moved forward. So the loans didn't have to be repaid on this window, and they have to be repaid forward. So that's one potential reason we believe why we observe these heterogeneous effects across the curve. Um, so I said, one looks at three tasks, so to get a sense of uh, how market liquidity was improving, we see a lot of improvement on Ireland, not so much for Portugal. So there's flattened out, the liquidity improved, and again, there is a heterogeneous effect along the chip. But then, I mean, this is just uh, three data points, uh, so it could be other factors, right? I mean, we, we decided to use the 211 because it's very clean from big monetary policy actions around. But still, we understand that this is just like uh, six points. So we, we, we are currently trying to show, to, 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 to bring all this, uh, this same insights out uh, from, from, from doing some economic work. And there are two exercises that we have done today. Uh, the first one is, uh, is this one, and it's basically what we do here is a regression-based event analysis, in which we take the benchmark bonds, the three and the five, that's the YCT, and we regress that against a set of uh, 10 dummies, 11 dummies for each of the, the DA. The, the dummy is, the DA is a dummy for the, for the day in which the original program was signed. The DF is another dummy for the date in which the country, in which the country to receive the first maturity extension. And DS is a, another dummy that collects the date in 2013 in which they receive the, the second maturity extension. And then what we, what we do is we regress the variables against a set of dummies that are telling us how many days before or after, within a week, uh, we are with respect to each of the operations. Basically, the idea that can, we have us very large set of controls, including all types of uh, ECB actions, the stock market dynamics, VIX, or in prices, we include more fixed effects. And the idea is that these different betas are telling us, uh, they are telling us the position of these yields with respect to anything that is away from these windows and that we like to call normal times. Right. So this is the dynamics of the IDs, three years, in, the, in a week around the, this is the first announcement in 2011. So as I just uh, showed, uh, we have this very clear downward, downward trend on the three. This is the five, very similar. This is the 10, very similar, but, very similar, but not, because look at the sizes. So this goes from five to about minus two. This goes from two to minus two, so this is, we go from seven to four, 
to allow to. So that effectively, again, what we are finding now is that the effect is heterogeneous across the curve, right? We do the same exercise for Portugal. We get basically the same heterogeneous effect across the yield curve, even if the size of the face is not the same. OK, this, just to be sure, we are just, because we were using just these benchmark bonds and separated each of them, so an additional exercise. We we just go to Bloomberg, we try to find every single bond issued by these countries between 2006 and 2016. So we end up having 130 bonds. Some of these bonds were issued a mature when there was not even official loans being provided, but we think that that's a good thing because those are zeros that we want to have in our relation. And then what we do is just a very simple model in which left hand side, we have a, our genes, right hand side, we have the lack of the yield, that's a type of is in there, minus one, and then we have uh, the characteristics of these official loans in Europe, plus again the same set of control, plus our uh, monthly fixed effects, uh, country fixed effects, and then one thing that we do, and it's not plotted in this, uh, in this regression, is, is we, we allow the, 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 the effect of the, of the maturities to be maturity specific. So we interact the maturity of the official loans with the maturity of the specific underlying bonds, just to see if there's heterogeneity is there. And these are the results. So basically the results you see, I mean, what we find is that there is a negative effect correlation between the prices and the maturities, as uh, we were postulating. But we find that that effect is stronger for short-term maturities than for longer maturities, which is, again, the heterogeneous effect. Second line there is showing us also that there is the positive uh, relation between the spreads charged by the official sector and the spreads charged in the private sector. Again, evidence of catalysis. This has plenty, plenty, plenty of uh, implications, but I don't have time to go through them. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. So uh, thank you very much for the uh, for this uh, uh, invitation. And, uh, so as I to actually mentioned, uh, uh, this work includes a set of uh, different papers, some uh, more theoretical, some more empirical. So for this presentation, I will actually discuss a little bit more the empirical part of uh, his uh, research. Um, that uh, essentially analyzes these uh, changes in uh, um, programs associated with uh, official creditors during the uh, Euro debt crisis that implied uh, essentially an extension of maturities and the reduction of uh, official uh, interest rates. So uh, these changes were actually significant. And uh, in the paper, the uh, uh, authors actually describe in detail the different bailout uh, programs and also the differences between uh, uh, approaches from IMF as well as uh, uh, European institutions. And then they actually run these uh, event analysis where uh, um, uh, they compare like the change in the government debt yields for Portugal and Ireland and all these changes in uh, uh, the program uh, terms. So uh, these event analysis actually show uh, significant numbers in terms of this uh, reduction of uh, uh, government uh, bond yields. And these were actually more important for uh, 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 short-term uh, uh, bond yields relative to long-term bond yields. Mm -hmm. um, they also find in the paper that there's also a significant uh, uh, impact on liquidity as measured by uh, 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 spreads between bid asks for uh, these bonds uh, around the time of these uh, programs. So uh, some potential mechanisms are uh, actually uh, well known for uh, the change in maturity associated with these uh, um, uh, uh, bailout programs and essentially longer maturity should reduce uh, the current debt burden through increasing the resilience of the sovereign to repay these debts. For the case of increasing liquidity, we don't have uh, that many models that can actually address uh, uh, why uh, this is the case, but we can see that lower fall probability for these uh, sovereigns after the changing programs 
may actually increase demand for uh, market funds, uh, for market uh, bonds of, uh, um, of the sovereign, and therefore increasing uh, the liquidity. So, uh, in order to understand the uh, main mechanisms that uh, uh, the authors are actually finding in the empirical uh, part, I uh, have here a very stylized model of uh, government uh, that defaults. So essentially we can consider that uh, a period when uh, uh, some amount of that uh, is actually restructured by uh, this uh, official lender and uh, uh, the restructuring profile of this debt can actually be decomposed into different uh, uh, periods. So period one, period two, period three, of course, uh, uh, by choosing different allocations associated with uh, 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 these debt requirements, there will also be different incentives for uh, uh, these uh, sovereign to default across these uh, different periods and uh, that should also be reflected on uh, debt prices that at least given the conditions that uh, I'm presenting here are mostly associated with uh, uh, probabilities of uh, uh, a realization of output that is below some uh, uh, threshold where this threshold will change with the amount of uh, debt repayment uh, that is scheduled for uh, that particular period. So uh, essentially the implications of this very simple model says that uh, reducing debt repayments today by deferring these uh, repayments to uh, the future actually improves that sustainability for the present day but at the cost of increasing, of decreasing this uh, sustainability uh, in the future and similar actually happens for uh, um, uh, for the yield of uh, uh, bonds, so uh, essentially backloading these uh, uh, debt repayments into the future check, uh, should uh, uh, decrease these uh, government yields for a short term debt, but at the same time increase the yields for a, a long term debt. So essentially, if you have an inverted uh, um, uh, yield curve, this uh, should imply a flattening of this uh, uh, curve, and this is also consistent with the findings of uh, uh, the paper. So, uh, uh, some comments regarding the, uh, these event analysis results that uh, were presented in the paper. So, uh, for the first one, uh, the authors actually compare the hill curve for uh, uh, different maturities, three, five, and then years uh, um, before and after these uh, program changes. Uh, and uh, uh, the program change actually extended maturity for uh, uh, 15 years, so it might be actually hard to find uh, this negative effect on uh, government yields, uh, given that the profile of repayment actually uh, uh, was below the 10 years, so it would be interesting to, to uh, extend this uh, um, event analysis to include uh, uh, longer terms of this uh, 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 yield curve. Um, the paper also finds that uh, official lending reduction of these uh, interest rates implied uh, very large savings on the overall uh, uh, debt burden for these uh, countries. Uh, so when we actually take into account the different type of, uh, or the two type of uh, um, uh, uh, program implications when uh, um, uh, uh, this debt was uh, restructured and the conditions actually changed, we may actually have a confounding effect between these uh, changing maturities versus, uh, versus uh, a reduction in uh, official lending uh, uh, interest rates. Um, so the authors also present some, uh, uh, so, you know, regarding the previous point, uh, um, uh, we could actually try to use the 2013 uh, um, uh, uh, program change in uh, uh, conditions that uh, mostly change the maturity to try to uh, separate between uh, uh, these two effects. So the, the authors also find some uh, evidence suggesting that uh, private, uh, that uh, uh, the private sector lending improved uh, 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 around these uh, uh, program changes for um, uh, for uh, uh, lending to the sovereign. And, uh, um, and essentially they look at this uh, um, uh, credit market uh, for securities in uh, this firm, so they actually find that uh, yields for these uh, corporate securities uh, reduce. Uh, but of course, uh, in uh, most countries in Europe, uh, markets for uh, uh, corporate bonds is uh, uh, relatively uh, limited, so it would be uh, also interesting to see if uh, this result also extends for other forms of uh, credits. 
And uh, uh, finally, we can also uh, think about uh, what are actually the lessons that uh, we learn from these uh, uh, changes in uh, terms associated with uh, official lending during the uh, crisis, associated with the 2012 uh, Greek debt restructuring pro uh, program. So uh, we may want to think about uh, incomplete uh, bank bailouts and uh, a potential contagion that uh, may have actually happen in uh, Cyprus. So regarding this uh, point, we actually know that in uh, 2012 uh, the Greek debt was deemed unsustainable and this actually led to, uh, um, to a default on private owners of uh, government uh, uh, debt for uh, Greece. Uh, so this uh, private sector involvement actually uh, uh, wiped out some uh, uh, large amount of uh, bank capital that actually triggered a bailout and uh, um, uh, this bailout was also used to uh, recapitalize banks associated with these uh, uh, default uh, events. Whether this recapitalization was enough uh, may be an open question, but in 2015 there was another bank run in uh, Greece that uh, led to some uh, uh, further bank recapitalizations. So at the same time, this type of uh, private sector involvement uh, uh, debt restructuring pro programs may uh, lead crisis uh, for other countries where there's no bailout uh, linked to the uh, program of the banks. This may be uh, what actually happened in uh, Greece. So also thinking about uh, um, these potential uh, incomplete uh, bank uh, recapitalizations, we may say that uh, um, uh, excess levers may actually uh, increase input misallocation due to the fact that now banks are not operating as uh, efficiently uh, uh, as uh, before, so this may actually affect uh, uh, investment and uh, uh, input allocation for different uh, uh, production units uh, in an economy. This may actually reduce contemporaneous uh, output and uh, simultaneously, if this type of crisis actually prolongs uh, in time, may even affect uh, uh, market access by uh, uh, lower debt prices of uh, um, uh, government uh, bonds, whether these bonds are uh, at the short end of uh, um, the maturity structure or at the uh, long uh, end. Uh, so essentially this type of uh, um, incomplete bank recapitalizations may undermine uh, the sustainability of uh, these uh, loan programs and uh, actually there is some uh, um, uh, recent and not so recent uh, empirical work that actually points that uh, indeed there is a bank, uh, an important bank uh, channel on uh, uh, um, explaining dynamics associated with investment and recoveries uh, uh, after a, a big recession and a recession that actually implies a, a default uh, situation. So just to uh, um, uh, conclude my presentation, I'm just plotting here uh, uh, three different crises for uh, Portugal, uh, um, Spain and Greece. So the two first panels are very well known, so this is the drop in uh, GDP for uh, an investment for these uh, three countries. We observe a very strong uh, uh, recession for uh, Greece and uh, uh, more mild recessions for Portugal and uh, uh, Spain. At the same time, for the last panel, I'm actually showing these uh, financial liabilities for private entities in uh, these, in these uh, three uh, different countries. We observe that uh, credit flows into Greece seem to be uh, uh, much slower than in the other two countries. And of course, we may want to see whether this uh, uh, prolonged uh, recovery for uh, the Greek crisis is actually related to this uh, slowdown of uh, credit disbursement in, uh, um, in Greece as compared to uh, Portugal and, uh, uh, and uh, Spain. Uh, so of course this is an open question, an open question but an open question that uh, uh, we can now think, uh, given that we have papers like uh, the one that uh, uh, Aitor presented in here, uh, that uh, analyzes the different problems and different conditions associated with uh, the problem. Thank you, Diego. Uh, let's just uh, let the floor speak. Any questions? Uh, from one or two questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve O'Connell, for So this is a question for, I 
podcast, Dr. Chatterjee, or Hansan Ches. Thanks very much. Uh, on the puzzle of why countries, borrowers, might like more maturities, I agree uh, just wholeheartedly. This is a great paper to give us uh, a reason for, for understanding the advice coming from all quarters to countries to avoid short-term debts. So putting the rollover risk into the model in the various ways you did and getting some leverage from that seems to be a great thing. Uh, but I, I guess I have a quite a specific question about maturities and especially for, uh, the question is, is there a distinct reason for countries to prefer longer maturities that is matched somehow to the structure of the assets that they're trying to acquire? So I'm thinking particularly of low-income countries who are now entering bond markets for very specific reasons, big infrastructure essentially, and are having to borrow pretty short for it. Uh, am I good? Um, could you comment, either of you guys, on whether there's an optimal maturity of debts of, of that type, or an optimal, and if there is, should these countries preemptively be moving the length of the maturities, for example, as their as their overall debt issues become a little more nervous? Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, sir, it's the right point. You know, like in uh, in corporate finance, this is kind of one of the issues. So, I actually work, and there is other work in which you look at why firms want to borrow long, and this is like matching the maturity of the asset and the maturity of the debt. Uh, in sovereign default, I, you know, I haven't seen papers looking at that, but it seems reasonable. You know, if, uh, our models just don't have, uh, let's say, the size, the, actually the most investment that the country can do in this model is nothing, and in some other models it's very simple, so it doesn't have a maturity for the investment. But if we would include, I, I would expect something like that, because in corporate finance, that's one of the factors. There are countries, I don't know, maybe Turkey is an example, where large infrastructure projects are basically run through the government, but is basically funded by, by tolls, etc., that are earmarked, or all the revenues earmarked for a particular investment vehicle. So in that case, there is a matching of uh, you know the, the project being, that is being funded and the money that is coming in, but the government is still in part of it, and you know there is still an issue, I guess, of our interest in that context. I'm not, I don't take my word for it, but I think maybe that's how some of the bridges uh, or some of the roads and infrastructure in Turkey is actually being funded, and in fact the funding was also in foreign dollar in, in foreign currency. So during the crisis, this became a big issue because they were paying out in euros or dollars uh, at the uh, exchange rate was had moved extremely at um, But in general, I don't know, maybe uh, th th these sorts of sovereign debts that we are talking about are like uh, borrowing on very general uh, accounts, I guess, of the government, the general obligation bonds as we call them in the US. Uh, but if you talk to people at the World Bank, for instance, I'm sure uh, there are funds being dispersed for very specific projects. You know? So there is like a whole range uh, of uh, funds that go into these countries. And uh, the things that we're talking about here are kind of a small subset of all of that. You know, these are basically bonds that essentially end up in the savings accounts. You know? And that's just a small part of total amount of funds these countries are getting to outside of Okay, many thanks to the speakers. Um, and also thanks to our audience to stay a little bit longer and patience for waiting for the late lunch. Let's close the session now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you to all the speakers for a very interesting presentation. Now, if I uh, can conclude uh, with uh, summarizing just one thing that I would like to say, not as an IMF person, but also here for the whole session today. Now, the debt issues and the debt restructuring, we should not forget that it is a debt sustainability analysis issue. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you all, for both the presenters and also all the attendees, 
for coming today and uh, having, I think, a very successful and interesting uh, uh, conference. Thank you all.